Welcome everyone to our webinar today called uh, Ransomware Response Tales from the Trenches presented by Landworks. I'm Martin Pietschak and I'll be your host today. Before we get started, however, this is meant to be a very interactive session. So please submit your questions using the Q&A or the chat widget located on the right hand side of your screen. You should be seeing a little a couple widgets there. Uh, if you have any questions, please submit them as we go. Uh, if, we, if for whatever reasons we are unable to uh, answer your questions at that point in time, do not worry. We will, uh, we will be addressing those after the session. We will also be sending out a recording of the session after the fact, plus a summary article that does discuss all the major points uh, between uh, of the conversation today with Eric. So let's get started. Uh, COVID not only brought havoc to many families around the world, but also the worst from the world's cyber criminals. Unfortunately, during COVID-19, global organizations have seen approximately almost 150% spike in ransomware attacks. And in the past six months, four Ontario-based organizations approached Landworks with significant crypto and ransomware events. And that's why we're here today. And one actually included extortion. So today I'm meeting with Eric Grudzkowski, the president of Landworks, to tell the story of ransomware response tales from the trenches. Let me introduce you to your speaker, Eric is a cybersecurity veteran with over 35 years of experience in information security. He's a seasoned executive that is currently the president of Landworks. Welcome, Eric. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Martin. Thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, these uh, ransomware events, they were devastating to these companies. It, it's like its like a car accident. Who prepares for a car accident? There's nobody. These were absolutely so devastating. And normally when they do happen, they happen on the weekend or they happen at Friday night. So the whole objective is that you get as many systems encrypted before it's discovered. So that's the whole premise that uh, that these uh, perpetrators are doing. Now, the, the skill set required to recover from these, it's, it's quite diverse. It's you need a security team, you need a network team, you need a Active Directory VMware backup specialist there. You need then also a desktop team to recover from uh, a whole mass of desktops that are encrypted as well. Eric, so that's, uh, I, I can only imagine what these uh, attacks were like. So let's just jump in, Eric. Let, tell me a little bit about these ransomware attacks. So how did they happen? So again, you know, the loss of business is, is huge. The, you know, idle staff, they can't do anything. Um, the financial penalty, penalties in one circumstance where the company couldn't deliver to commitments, so they have to actually have a financial uh, penalty. Um, brand damage, um, the the cost, the hard costs itself for for recovery, um, you know, ransom paid. Uh, that's you know that happened in in our cases as well. Um, the extortion component, um, you know, letters to the privacy commissioner. Uh, the list goes on. It, it's it really really is devastating. And you know the number of hours, countless hours that the staff have to work, the IT staff have to work to actually recover the business and get it back on its feet is, is, uh, is, is paramount. So Eric, this sounds, uh, obviously there's quite a few hard tangible costs. Um, like for instance, I'm kind of curious, what was the actual downtime um, to the business and the productivity of these customers? That must've been devastating. Like on average, how long would you say these companies were down or the operations were down while these attacks were occurring? So. It did vary, but for the most part, it's two to three days as a minimum. Um, the that, and that that's really just for the line of business app to get everything back online is is typically two weeks. It, it's an, and sometimes even longer, quite frankly. Um, you know, imagine that you have to rebuild every machine on your network. You have to find the software. You have to find the license keys. There's and there's so many lessons learned on this. Um, you know, it's it really again, you're not prepared for it. Nobody, no company is prepared for it typically. And I, uh, you know, back to that analogy of a car accident, like you're just simply, it, it just takes you blindsided. And the recovery part is uh, is very difficult. That sounds quite catastrophic, actually. Two weeks. Wow. Um, this must be especially hard now that COVID is ha happening, and many organizations are, and, or many employees, including. IT pros are in fact working remotely. So 
it's quite unbelievable sometimes to think that something such a small, simple, well, simple, brute password attack can level such a damage to a business. Yeah. Um, if there was anything, it was uh, COVID was um, it was a benefit in a way that, um, you know, so many people are working from home. The notebook computers that would uh, typically be at a desk or desktop computers that would be typically, you know, on somebody's desk and turned on, they were powered off or they weren't there. So there was far less of that collateral damage for rebuilding them. Nonetheless, it, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make it any easier. And in cases too, where, you know, you have your SCCM server uh, or your imaging server that's on the network, it's on Active Directory. And when that gets crypto too, that kills your ability to effectively and uh, automate in an automated manner, restore your desktops, restore your assets. Well, you know, this, I think this is one of the first times, uh, Eric, that I'm hearing that COVID uh, is actually a saving grace or anything, but uh, it's ironically maybe in the situation it does work. But still, rebuilding remotely uh, does not seem like a simple matter at all. So did you observe any interesting commonalities between these four attacks? Yeah, un unfortunately, yes. And and these are going to sound really simple, but they, they really are commonalities. And uh, in a number of circumstances, there was RDP that was available on the network, or sorry, on the internet. There was Citrix on the network that was on the internet, rather, that was um, you know able to be logged in in that manner. So these are um, like systems that are vulnerable in a, in their state. Because um, here, I'm just going to show you really quick. Um, I'm just going to show you really quick the um, some of the tools that are available. For example, like here, these are all the tools that are free and available on the internet that will do a brute force password hack. So if your uh, Citrix, RDP, Horizon View, any of these are on the internet, these tools can be customized, can be downloaded, they're free, and there's all kinds of them that can just go ahead and start doing a password hack on you. So that is, wow. um, you know, that, that's that's the first, you know, uh, part of it. Um, now, if you're not logging or uh, identifying failed password attempts, these things can just run for days and days and they will find passwords. So it may not be an admin password initially, but at least it might be a, um, a credential of a user. And that's the first door. That's the first entry into your network. And that's that can be catastrophic in itself. And I'm assuming they can be running on the back end without even knowing they're running. Exactly. So, you know, here's an example, like another one. Um, you know, these phishing attempts for, um, you know, I'm going to give you an example here, just Office 365 login pages. They, they look so well, they're so well done. So here's a really quick test for you, Martin. So this is uh, one of three, and I'll have you try to determine which of these are real and which are not uh, real. Okay, that one looks pretty real so far. This is number two. So just to reiterate, there's two fake ones and one real or only one real? There's only one that's real. One is real, okay, because that's a problem because that one looks real too, okay. That's number two. And this is the final one. Uh, wow, you know what, I'm gonna give up because I have no idea. They look all pretty much identical to me in terms of feasibility being real. The, they leverage the Microsoft brand. Uh, I wanna guess the first one is the, the real one? No, it's this one here. This oh, is the wow. One. Okay. And that's the current one that's uh, that's posted right now if you're logging into Office 365. So, so essentially, as a user, I use a sign-in button and I give them my information, which is actually being sent to the perpetrators rather than Microsoft itself. They, were, they would be collecting that information that you provide. And then at this point, they would 
probably scrub your IP address, your public IP address that you're doing this work from, and they'll now try to log into your local network with your credentials. So whether it be an SSL VPN uh, type of um, scenario, or it, whether it be RDP, or Citrix, or Horizon View, they've got your credentials. Wow, that's incredible. Like uh, very sophisticated, indeed. Yeah, they are very, very good. Okay. But the, the point here, it, it is so simple. It's such a simple thing, but you would absolutely be surprised how many people still fall for this. It's so, so common. Mm. Now, you mentioned something about privileged credentials. I just want to clarify. Obviously, I'm not an IT pro, so I'm kind of curious. Does it really mean that the privileged credential is someone like uh, an admin user who has access to the back end, or is there another particular or is it like a standard user? How, how do you define privileged credentials? Yeah, so obviously a privileged credential obviously is somebody that has um, AD root able to um, have access to any file or grant themselves access to any file, uh, any system that's uh, on your network. But the, um, you know, clearly having an admin credential is, it, it equates to more damage. And what it allows you to do, and the, the back, sorry, the perpetrators, they're, the first thing they go after is your backup server. So you're, they, they try to kill your ability to recover. So if you've got an admin credential, um, that equates to the ability to attack your uh, backup server. But still, if you have any credential, just Joe, Joe, John Doe user, it still allows you to, you can insert yourself uh, with that credential, this tool is to actually insert a, uh, um, a user or a um, PC, uh, onto your AD, and you can just run those tools that I had shown you earlier, and those are easily available, and you can run it. So now you're doing a dictionary hack, and as long as the um, IT admin is not monitoring the event log and monitoring uh, or having a locked out for failed password attempts, you're just gonna run this utility until you've got a admin credential and where you can do the most damage. But there was another situation too where the they didn't go for the admin credential because the particular user they got the credential from had enough permissions on the server to get their line of business application and customer data and so all they did was exfiltrate that so take it off the network take a copy of it and then they were able to encrypt it and then encrypt the guy's machine that um, actually was the um, uh, patient zero so to speak so it doesn't necessarily have to be an admin credential, but you can do a lot more damage with it. You know, Eric, it's kind of scary because you're making it sound like these these perpetrators have an easy way in. So begs the question: Do you think there was anything that you observed for these cases where they could have been prevent that could have prevented it? Yeah. So I'm a huge proponent of two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication (MFA). Uh, Here's the scenario. You don't have to outrun a bear. You just have to outrun your friend. And this applies here. You don't you don't have to have your organization as Fort Knox, but you have to make it such that every all of your neighbors are much easier to break in than to you. So that, that's a that's a huge factor here. So two factor authentication, it accomplishes and it would have stopped every single one of the ransomware issues that we dealt with. Um, you know, I'm not saying that it's an answer for absolutely everything because there are uh, tools that allow um, people to, you know, get into your network if you run something incorrectly, uh, unpatched machines, there's so many aspects to it. But in our, what we experienced, that is a single common denominator that could have saved them. But here, let me, um, you know, let me show you a couple of things here. Um, I'm going to take control, and I'm just going to show you here. So these are all, everything I'm going about to show here is all real. This is a real ransom note. Wow. So, so it had the customer's name right here. Obviously, I took that out. And you can see that, um, you know, these guys here are just saying, 
this is just a business and you can tell that English is not their first language here. We absolutely do not care about you and your deals except getting benefits. If we do not do our work and liabilities, no, so you can see these guys are not um, in this country. Uh, I do know where these guys actually reside from, but they provide information on how to download a Tor browser and uh, provide them uh, with the ransom. There's obviously a, a key that they provide. This is only a quarter of it. it it's actually massive. And, you know, so this is the readme portion um, of this uh, ransom note. Now, here is the other portion where it is the, where they're asking for the actual ransom itself. And this is real. Um, this was um, a couple of days in because it happened over the weekend. So this is from the Monday. It's showing that they're asking for a million dollars US, and wow. that is the cryptocurrency that they're asking for. Um, this, this is just absurd, by the way. Um, after June 22nd, so that's a week later, they're asking for $2 million. Like, you know, that's absurd. I realize that. Now here though, they're, they're very nice. They provide all of the details on how to buy the cryptocurrency and from different countries, and so there, it's quite detailed. Now, what they're also providing here is they're providing proof to you that we do have the keys to decrypt. So they allow you to upload a couple of the files and that is the extension that was on every single encrypted file. So you would upload each of the files that you want to show proof of and they'll let you do a couple and they will decrypt it and give it back to you. So that's their their proof that um, you know this is a hijacking or this is a you know this is a kidnapping. This is proof that the person is still alive, so to speak. Eric, this is insane because this looks legit, quite professional, to be perfectly honest. I mean, okay, maybe the English grammar aside, but it looks quite quite real and professional, unfortunately. Yeah. So what I'm going to show you now, um, I'm going to open a Tor browser. So we're going to go out in the dark web. That's the gateway to the dark web, isn't it? It is a gateway to the dark web. Now you see, I'm not sure if you saw quickly in the background, it was um, opening tunnels across the internet. And just to show you really quickly what it's uh, doing, I'm just gonna type, what is my IP? And it uses DuckDuckGo as a browser, which is a browser that, um, that, or that uh, it's a search engine rather that does not keep any content. So it never keeps anything on you. So just to show you where that is, and it's slower. You see how it's thinking up there. It's slower because it's encrypting everything. It's bouncing around to various different proxies and it's hiding my identity. And I'm coming out in, I believe that is Germany. So That's that right. is somewhere, somewhere in Europe and some small little place, and it will change every single time you open it. So that's how this browser maintains your your, your credentials. It keeps it private so that um, nobody knows really where you're coming from. So I'm gonna open up another tab here, and I'm gonna paste the URL, and this is actually one of the URLs from the ransom note. Mm. Again, it's kind of slow. Uh, it's going out in the dark web. You see the URL up here is a huge bunch of characters. That's uh, with a dot onion. That's um, th that's the mechanism they use on the dark web. Uh, now this thing here is, uh, this guy here is brand new. Uh, that just came up there today actually. And these this is uh, changing uh, every day pretty much. Um, the And to reiterate, this is the uh, blog and the site from Revol, which is the Russian uh, group. So th they just downloaded this person's files and you see on here, they published the fact that they have everything in this particular th in this particular view so that you're not able to download it at this time. Um, what they're looking to do is probably now send him the notices to pay a ransom. So there, this is the proof that they have his data and he, they have absolutely everything on this particular individual. And uh, 
they will post it and make it available if they if he doesn't pay. So here, here's a whole list. These are all companies that um, they're pretty much in chronological order um, that were done or that were uh, encrypted and data exfiltrated the last little while. You see this pages upon pages of it here. Wow. So I'll just flip to the second page here. And again, it's a little slower lo loading it, but you know, here here's some, they're actually posting some of the files. So I'm just gonna open it up. And we're not gonna go into anything really uh, detailed here uh, or um, you know, where there's, we're gonna show anything that's uh, nasty or anything. But you'll, one of the things you, you'll notice here, it was the 4th of October that they uploaded this. It's typically always on a weekend. So that's where they're exfiltrating data in hopes that they'll be able to complete getting the data out of your location and they'll be able to complete the encryption component and make, making it the most effective ransomware incident so that you don't find it happening over the weekend. That's the whole premise of what they do. But you know, in here, you can see this is the posting of um, this uh, company's, um, all their files. Wow. So uh, can you can I ask you something? So you, when you would go back to that page where you're listing all the different uh, attacks, is this just from one organization, or is that a central place where all these ransomware notes are being actually posted? Unfortunately, this is just one organization. There is wow. um, Maze is another one that's uh, very very popular and or unpopular if you're hit by them. Uh, they are um, probably posting and having their own uh, blog like this with even more uh, data and, and more sites that they're hit. So what I'm gonna show you now is we're gonna go to the auction. So this is the place where the public can actually bid on and buy data that they feel is having value. So. Here's an example, Groupman is a law firm in New York and they represent artists, music artists typically. And they had Madonna's uh, files. Now Madonna, Madonna's might have been sold because they don't post it, it's not posted here anymore. But you see these artists, like you can wow. start bidding on ushers uh, and it would be his contracts, uh, legal documents. Um, you're seeing Bruce Springsteen, still here um now this would be the contracts for universal and mtv so you see the the prices are a little bit higher and then bad boy entertainment um you know price fairly high as well then oh lebron james i'm not sure why he is here but uh, mariah carey Nicki minaj so you go back for a second so this is actually one point it is one gigabyte of Nicki Minaj's legal documents. That that's is incredible. One. That's essentially probably her whole legal history with that firm. That's right. As long as that firm has been representing her, that they have um, exfiltrated all of her files. And it would be typically music contracts is what uh, they would have here. Unbelievable. So, yeah. Well, that, low price of $1 million. Eric, well, let's, let's do a collection. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's um, you know the whole point here is that uh, it, it's scary. These guys are existing and um, they're doing extremely well uh, from a business perspective. Unbelievable, Eric. This is quite scary to be honest. I know it's, I'm joking aside, but uh, considering the ransomwares and how successful they've been in the past, this is quite an endeavor. I never expected to be as professional as it looks to be, which is uh, of course the scary part. That is absolutely true. It is a business to them. So basically what I'm hearing is that it's not just about the, the crypto locking of the data itself, which basically says, okay, we'll keep the, the, the data hostage until you pay us a ransom. But also, if you don't do anything, they're able to sell this data to the, whoever does the next biggest bidder. And so, in this case, you know, whoever wanted to buy Madonna's content, maybe not even herself. Yeah. Um, so. In one circumstance here, one of the companies where they were able to restore everything, they had, they were back in business, they had all of their systems back up and running. 
And but unfortunately, it was these guys that had their data, though, and they ended up paying regardless of having it all restored. They didn't need the, the uh, decryption keys. They paid um, $300,000 US, so about four four $450,000 Canadian um, to have them not post the data. So now this is a this is a key thing too. These guys used ransomware negotiators. So just think of this. This is a, this is a career that your professional ransomware negotiator and they got them from one million dollars to down to three hundred thousand. So that's like they got them down one third. Um, it, it's it's um, it, it's incredible. Like these guys, it, it's real. Um, it happens all the time. And I will tell you that. Uh, the site that I was going to go to, that is the guys that, um, it, the, the, the group is called Revil, R-E-V-I-L, and they did not post the data. So these are honest criminals. I know this is a, an oxymoron, but they actually were good to their word. They paid the ransom and they did not put their name up there at all and they did not post any data. So, you know, these guys, it's a business to them. It's nothing it's more like than that. Yes, there there is honor between thieves, I suppose. So, but I, I I could totally see that. They have to be legit, otherwise nobody will want to pay the ransom, thinking that they would sell the data anyhow. So that's, there has to be right. some legitimacy to that. Uh, I can totally see that. So now I know that we talked about the in, to, in the trenches part because you've seen you've seen a lot of this firsthand. Um, so tell me about those in the trenches tips that you that you think would have helped to prevent some of those attacks. Right. So again, I'm gonna go back to the two-factor authentication. If you have anything, RDP, Citrix, Horizon View, SSL VPN, I can't stress the fact that uh, having two-factor authentication. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, no domain admin account should be available on VPN access. So uh, again, just uh, least privileged, uh, credential to get in. So no admin credential should be allowed to, to be gained from the outside. Um, make sure that your passwords are 10 characters, upper lowercase, special characters, make them hard. Um, it just makes it so much more difficult for a password uh, cracking tool or dictionary hack. It just makes it so much more difficult for that tool and hopefully you'll discover it before they're actually successful with it. Um, never have a, uh, a, a admin privileged uh, attached to your normal login. So if I'm logged in as Eric, that credential could never have an admin uh, equivalent to it. Um, and this was one of the situations and one of the circumstances that that did happen. And so that devastated, they, they were able to um, walk through the entire network. So what I'm saying by that is that have a separate uh, like Bob admin account. And then what we use in, at Landworks, we use machine generated passwords. They're random, they're probably 35, 40 characters long, upper, lower, uh, every character in the book. And you simply can't hack that um, in, in a reasonable amount of time uh, because of just the randomness of it. Um, th there's so many other best practices, but the ones I'm just talking about right now are the ones that we specifically saw in these ransomware attacks. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. And and we we chatted briefly about the backups. You you said that they is one of the things that they go after the first. Uh, so how do these perpetrators actually target them? Um, and let's dive deeper into that a little bit. Can you just how do organizations actually go about protecting those backups? Because I'm assuming that it's not just about recovery of the data, but because you can recover it from something, which is in this case the backup itself. Yeah. So one of the lessons learned, and and this was huge is take your backup server off of the domain because if you do if you do have a privileged credential that is compromised it allows them to go after your backup server first and that's what they're going to do because they're going to try to eliminate your means to recover and your your means to recover means the lack of uh, uh, you paying the ransom so that's what their objective is they make it really really difficult for you so um, mm -hmm. I, I can't stress the importance of that, and we learned this the hard way, uh, or our customers did, unfortunately. Um, you know, where feasible, use a locally connected, connected NAS. So 
And what's happening here is the NAS will have a password associated with it, which the backup server exclusively has. So it's not a share on the network. Because if you're using Veeam, for example, as your backup and it's local storage, that backup, that's going to be a share that is accessible with a uh, admin credential and it can be encrypted without even touching your backup server itself. So having a separate NAS, it, it, it just makes it one level harder for them. And then back, best practices says keep three copies of your backup um, in different locations and or media. So all of these factual lessons learned from these incidents. Mm. So you mentioned, I think you mentioned uh, sort of the external um, backup, which I'm assuming one of those backups would be tape or something like that. So which makes me think that there is like this uh, requirement of the IT staff to physically go in and changing those tapes. Uh, so how does that happen, especially now during COVID when, you know, your IT pros are not necessarily on site, they're not going in every day to to do that tape exchange. And so, so what, how does that work typically? Right. So um, very difficult without a tape library. So yes, um, if you have single tape drives, somebody has to go in. So, you know, cloud copy makes most sense in this particular case. Um, obviously in that situation, nobody has to go into the office, but if you're using cloud uh, copy, so you've got your primary backup on site and a, a replica or a copy of it is sent to the cloud, you have to set the backup or restore time rather expectation because it's got to come back down over the internet. And if you're trying to restore four, eight, 12, 30 terabytes across the internet, you can just imagine that that's going to take days. So you have to set that expectation and build your plan around that expectation. Now, some people intend to use one of their remote branch offices, say it's Calgary, for example, which is great. I'm going to take my backups that happen during the day in, say, Toronto, and I'm going to send a backup copy of it uh, over to my Calgary office. Now, the problem is if that office is on MPLS or a, a, a solid nailed up VPN, again, it, with a uh, compromised admin credential, they can go across the WAN and find out that, find that copy as well and encrypt it. So in one of the instances, the, it was a well, well executed um, ransomware attack, uh, and it was a privileged credential that they did have. The uh, encryption uh, executable propagated via domain controllers and encrypted everything right across the entire country. So every single site, every single machine that was domain connected was fully encrypted, every server. So that would have killed that remote backup copy as well so bear that in mind if if you lose your backup or sorry your uh, admin credential that's gone too so uh, you know we do offer service like that in in each of our uh, uh, two uh, data centers here in ontario and what we do though if if uh, required or if um, subscribed to we have a dedicated nas appliance that is uh, would be for that specific customer exclusive and then we drive it to the site where if you're encrypt if you're crypto we would actually deliver it on site and you can do the restore by a 10 gig and it is disconnected from your network it is not part of your network and it is safe so it sounds like that one of the key elements to success is that make sure that your data centers are not all connected to each other in a sense so that it gives you the additional security uh, but what are the what are the other kind of backup pointers, like what else can can you know IT pros do in this situation? Yeah, so this is again, these are these are specifically lessons learned. So there were a couple instances where, oh yeah, that server we really don't need to back it up. We rarely use it. Some of the one of them had, for example, some you know source code on it, and it wasn't properly backed up. And um, yeah, it's lost. It's gone. Uh, it, we had no means to restore it. So the the point here is. Look at your not so important backup, uh, you know, servers, and and do it maybe once a week, once a month at least. You know, I know there's a lot of legacy systems, for example, maybe an old accounting system that you 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 pulled off of. Um, back it up, say once a month. Make that you know, create that job and and just do it. Um, one of the other things, test your restores. Um, 
you know, test the restores from locally, test the restores from offsite, test the restore from tape, make sure it works, and then document that process and, and you know, document what uh, virtual machines are in each of the backup jobs. Because if the thing is encrypted, if the, if the server is encrypted, you've lost that. So you need some of this documentation. And, you know, one of the others is that if you can't afford to lose, uh, you know, a day's worth of data from a business critical server, back it up three times a day, back it up four times a day, back it up at a frequency that you deem that you can, you know, comfortably lose. Mm. Interesting. So it sounds like, you know, there, it sounds like there, you, you should probably invest a considerable amount of time and, and processes or, or resources in order to, to make this happen. Uh, but let's talk about, besides obviously the backup, the two-factor authentication that you mentioned earlier as those things that can really help save your behind, so to speak. Um, what should organization really focus on next? Like what is the prior to being hit? Something that, you know, perhaps, perhaps be a little bit proactive. Yeah, so user education. Um, you know, as stated earlier, most doors are opened initially with a fake email. It's it takes a human interaction. And you know, this sounds so simple, but it is so important. Um Verizon did a study, 81% of breaches are from stolen or weak passwords. Can't stress that enough. Test your staff, educate your staff, um, you know, post things send newsletters, um, you know, lunch and learns perhaps with the staff that, that show them what a fake URL looks like. Mm. So it sounds like it really is the end users, so not necessarily the admin or privileged users, it's really about just the UNI, uh, about trying to figure that out, what that may look like, which is very interesting to me because obviously my inclination is to use passwords, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, apparently one of the most popular passwords out there. Um, so, but at the high level, you know, obviously there's processes that need to be involved, user education, but describe what the process to recover a company from ransomware should look like. Right. Um, so the first thing that you have to do typically is you have to build an isolated recovery network. So you have to create separate VLANs, you have to isolate an environment that you know um, it, it is not corrupt, it is not, there's no ransomware on it. So effectively, initially day one, it has no servers on it. So you create that environment, you now create uh, some policies on the firewall that is attached to that um, VLAN or VLANs, and you disallow anything inbound. So you're doing a deny, deny effectively on the firewall. So now, uh, you'll then create some specific firewall policies that allows at least your antivirus product uh, to go out and get updates. So it allows it, allow yourself that you can um, begin the recovery, but uh, validate anything that you've restored so far. Now, uh, the first thing that you obviously want to uh, do a restore of is um, your domain controllers with the FISMA roles. So that goes first. And now, the thing is, all of this is assuming that your backups are not encrypted. So if you don't have the means to decrypt, I would say start looking for a ransomware negotiator because at this point, um, you know, that's your means to recover. But this is, I'm presuming here that you still do have your backup server intact because you followed some of the uh, advice earlier. So the first thing you're going to, again, you're going to do now that you've got your backup server on here you've got the first main controller restored, it's up. Uh, it has no access to the outside world other than to update its uh, antivirus and, um, and, and so that you can uh, test it and clean it and ensure that it's, uh, it is clean, um, change your passwords. So change the admin passwords, you don't know how it's compromised or what, so that's the first thing that you're gonna do on here once you've got the first one up. Um, so uh, one of the things you're, you're gonna wanna do now is immediately run your next gen uh, antivirus and you may want to download and pay for and use a couple of products to be absolutely sure so mm -hmm. if if um you know at this point money should be no object because you've got to get your organization up and running so now that you're from, you're convinced that your domain controller is up and going now you're going to start uh restoring your line of business application so and um 
hopefully you have a document that um, you know that has some of the information on it and prioritize what do you need to have restored first and what are the interdependencies if you have one line of business server often there's other servers that are independent or dependent on it sql servers and and such so you're going to restore those you're going to again do a uh, scan of them um, you're going to make sure that they're all clean and at that point to get your line of business up and going again you're going to start doing some in the background rebuilding of workstations so again hopefully you've got your software keys uh, passwords and, um, and and software itself available that you can at least rebuild machines for uh, production for one for accounting so you're basically you can basically run your business at a, at a very low level and then you you proceed and, and expand it from there it did happen that we, you know, it, it, one customer got a little bit too aggressive and they connected a, a, a switch out from the floor. And of course the machine was out there, it still had the encryption software on it, still had the malware on it, and it re-encrypted everything that was restored. So I can't stress how careful you have to be and diligent when you're doing these restores, that you can't, it, it wastes so much time to, have them re, be re-encrypted. Um, at this point, you have to make a decision too, is do I start, now that I've got you know, four or five, I've got my line of business applications and a uh, few workstations, do I do another backup? So that's gonna be a call that you make on the fly, whether it's more important to actually continue with business or is it more important to have a backup such that I can recover at least from this point. Um, so now, as I said, you do this process again and uh, for, uh, for your workstations and the remaining servers and you expand it like that. So that, that's a, effectively in a nutshell. Now, it, it, sounds, it, it sounds very easy uh, you know, to do this, but actually it requires a lot of skill sets and, um, and it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of hours to do it. Well, it, it clearly, it sounds like, and, and obviously the what you're sounding like, you do it slow enough that you don't reinfect everything. It sounds like there's a high risk of reinfection and that's why you're recommending do it from a skeleton-based uh, restructuring, right? Give it the bare minimum that you need to operate and then slowly repeat and rinse and repeat to, to get you there. So that sounds very <laughs> quite, quite complex to be honest, very process driven. Uh, and I'm assuming a lot of IT pros are thinking like, oh wow, are we ever, do we really have such a strong process in mind here? But uh, I'm sure there's other lessons that were learned throughout the restore process. Um, yeah, the, what were some of those things that you observed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the first and foremost things is that, you know, many people have password files, they've got uh, network documentation. What happens when it's on the network and it's also encrypted? So now your activation keys for your software, your uh, some of the passwords that you have that, uh, um, you know, that are for some of the applications, root passwords, et cetera. Now that file is encrypted as well. You've got to, keep, you have to keep a copy of this on the network and it can be something as simple as, uh, you know, a Costco external USB drive that you plug in and that's, that that uh, drive does come with encryption software for it. And you copy some of this stuff onto that drive, put it in a safe, put it in your lockable drawer and have that available. You'd, you'd be surprised how having that documentation and having the keys and having uh, IP addresses and all that type of thing um, at your fingertips, not encrypted, will save you so much time. Um, there's, there's a whole number of other things too, like, you know, you, you got to plan that your server for restoring workstations is going to be encrypted also. So, um, you know, having the software and having it, uh, having things available and having that plan ahead of time and give us some thought, um, you know, that really did uh, set us back in, in one circumstance where, yeah, the SACM server was, uh, was fully encrypted, it was useless. So we actually had to bring a imaging server from our office, from our lab, uh, into this customer. And um, we had to start, you know, building, making a gold image from scratch and, uh, and start restoring it. Um, one of the other things too is that 
try to keep, if you can, enough free storage that you can preserve the encrypted servers for later forensics. Now, where this is important is if it, um, if you're in an industry where the privacy commissioner comes into play, or um, you know, you, you, where you need to determine who patient zero was and and see the the attack vectors that they did use. Um, that's the only time that uh, you know it's going to be useful to have the um, a preserved server. But uh, if you can do it, keep it. Um, you know, there's there's many more uh, technical details, but um, you know, for for each of them, and every circumstance really was uh, was was different. But you know. The, the pointers for Active Directory alone, that could be a whole two-hour webinar in itself. Well, maybe we'll save that for the next one then. Um, yeah. But I, I believe you have something you want to show us as well around this, uh, Eric. Um, sorry. Oh, no, I think we're, no, never mind. I think we're actually getting close to the, the question and answer period. Um, That's right. So Maya, do, is there any questions that have come through um, to from the team from the, uh, from the attendees? Okay, I, I, I see one question here, Eric. So actually, a couple have come through. So it says uh, one question from George. It says uh, this is actually a very interesting question. I, I'm very curious about the answer to this. It's like where uh, what do the ransomware negotiators that you mentioned earlier say or do? to actually negotiate the price down? And B, do you think, can you actually trust trust them as uh, as they do that negotiate on your behalf? Okay, um, good question. So uh, this, this was a firm in the US. It costs $5,000 flat fee, 2,500 up front, 2,500 when done. And effectively what they do is, um, they use things like, oh, this company can't afford it. Because of COVID, their sales are way down. Um, they're, they're using all kinds of tactics and strategies and that's not their first time at it. So, you know, the, the, um, the, the ransomware guys, they do want, they want to get paid. So if they get paid something is better than nothing. So, in the circumstance here where they were engaged, they, they knocked it down by, you know, to one third of the initial initial ask. And for some reason, they always start at a million dollars. And I think that is common because they know that if you have ransomware insurance, that's often where the price tag or, or whether the, what the um, insurance will cover. So that's where, you know, the starting point. But what they will do is they will send you the transcripts, transcript of the interaction with the ransomware um, people. So that's how, um, you know, you can kind of trust them and it, it it's legit and it's a legit business. That's uh, that's quite uh, crazy to me that it's a legit business, but it sounds like to me that those re negotiated themselves are probably uh, quite good at what they do. So we have to believe that what they're doing. You mentioned something about insurance. I mean, maybe that's a follow-up question that I have personally. Um, so the ransomware insurance, is this something that you'd recommend for to customers and, and prospects to, to look yeah, into? Absolutely. Um, you know, that's part of your portfolio for defense because what the ransomware insurance does pay for as well is a portion or it pays for your recovery costs. So there's a, this hard, car, uh, hard costs associated with the recovery and that's consulting, um, you know, loss of business. So that is part and parcel of that insurance. So it's highly advised. Absolutely. Mm. So I have a question that just came in through, um, which is, what are the chances that federal agents can actually cash those guys? None. The, really? answer, is, the answer is really simple. So these guys these guys are super smart. Um, you know, I'm going to use the the Revo guys because they were the ones specifically that hit a couple of our customers, and um, they are based out of Russia. And how do you, for you know, a million dollars, a million dollars, like how do you get our government to try to track these guys down? And they're so smart. They are absolutely so smart. They're so autonomous. So, you know, obviously they're using the dark web where you it's virtually untraceable and all the strategies and all the mechanisms for payment, 
for communication. Everything is cloaked. So the I, I haven't heard of a single, uh, unless it's super, super high profile that is affecting um, Department of Defense or something at that level, if it's just a normal organization, um, zero. They'll never wow. catch them. So uh, I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, so it, you, you, obviously, when these ransomware attacks occur, you know, what's the typical payout rate? Like, do you find that 90% of the time organizations find themselves having to pay out, or 50% of the time? Or what? What do you think is sort of the the ratio that you've observed? Yeah, one of the larger ones that we were involved in, um, global organization, and and. That was the first question that I asked on Monday morning. Are we paying the ransom or is this a recovery effort? And as soon as they said recovery effort, I didn't ask a single additional question on that. We focused on recovery. But um, I think that, and, and you see it in the press though too, like, you know, Molson, or sorry, uh, the beer store, um, I, I believe they paid a mill uh, earlier in the year. Um, you know, these guys, many, for as many that are, uh, in the press, there's probably 10 times that are not in the press because they don't want that uh, brand. Uh, yeah, the the, brand, the bad publicity for the brand. So mm -hmm. um, there, these guys are filthy rich. Like this, um, this Revo group, uh, they actually about a month ago I saw it posted. They um, they they provided a million dollars in Bitcoin in a Russian forum to recruit additional staff additional people it's a business so it's um yeah it, it's it's uh it's it's crazy it's crazy martin uh, absolutely um so I, I there's another question that just came in it says um okay so it says if i got hit by ransomware today what's the very first thing i should do i, I know i think you've, you've touched on that eric but uh but could you want to elaborate a little bit on that yeah, so, you know, at this point, it's going to be an assessment. What is encrypted? So the first thing that you absolutely do is you disconnect the Internet. So you disconnect your firewall, just unplug it, uh, the mm -hmm. connection from the Internet. So that's the first thing you do, because if there's still, uh, often it needs a command and control server, and if they're still getting keys and encrypting in the background, other machines, it at least will stop that command and control communication. So that is uh, job number one. Then it's an assessment. You know, what is encrypted? Um, what's the stature of my backups? Like, what's my ability to recover from this? And, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a team to look at it too. So there's, you know, there's, there's people from, you know, executives in the business and there's technical people that have to evaluate the damage. And it's really, you know, you've smashed your car, is this fixable? Uh, did the airbags go off or not? So, you know, it, it really does vary, but um, you have to do that initial assessment. And then if it's such that, um, and, and there's going to be a ransom note. So you're going to read that ransom note. And if they exfiltrated data, it's typically on that as well, that they'll they'll highlight it. So you've got to do, so you've got to make some really tough decisions. Um, calling the insurance company is one of them as well, assuming that you do have ransomware insurance. So if you can determine that your backup server is intact, um, at this point, yeah, you start the plan that what I highlighted earlier of building that um, completely isolated network, uh, recovery network, and start uh, the recovery process. And you know, build teams within the organization. Uh, SWAT teams is going to be groups that uh, are going to be specialists that are looking after the desktop, and hopefully you've got the, the software and activation keys, and they'll start doing that. And the restore process, unfortunately, is quite quite lengthy. It takes you know, there's times that you're sitting around and you're just waiting for things to you know finish restoring. But um, yeah, that's, you know, it, it does vary by organization and the complexity of the organization. But, um, you know, in a nutshell, that's it. That's it. Eric, I have one more question and, and then I think we're gonna, should start wrapping up. Uh, but basically after the actual ransomware attack, how do you go and find the, how people actually managed to get in? Like what was, you know, that vulnerability perhaps that was, uh, you know, taken? Right. So at this point, um, 
sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not so easy, but you're looking at event logs and the event logs of, and this is your remote access appliances, this is um, your firewalls, this is your domain controllers, this is various other servers. So usually an event log um, or a number of them that you'll correlate will give you a lot of clues of what happened. So that's one of the first things. Obviously your firewall logs, you're looking in there, um, is hopefully that you've been keeping them and that you have a tool that, um, you know, that uh, that has them long enough such that uh, you, you have the time to examine it. And, um, you know, the, the one of the last things is that uh, there are companies that you can send a crypto image to, and they are specialists in uh, digging deeper and finding out, um, you know, what are some of the, what, where's the, t the time bombs that are inside this uh, encrypted image? So they'll see what things, you know, are, are, are modified. Um, it, it could be, um, you know, um, it, it could be the registry uh, settings, various things like that, files. Um, so it, it varies, but th there's organizations that are specifically uh, doing that. Eric, uh, this is fantastic. Thank you very much. I know I've certainly learned quite a few things. Uh, it's scary. I'm going to go change my password now from the one, two, three, four, five, seven, uh, and my PIN number. Uh, but uh, just want to say thanks again. And I, uh, there's no more questions that I see. However, I do want to say to the audience, thank you very much for participating. And please, if you if you feel like some of the questions maybe you st still may be pondering, please submit them to us. Uh, I'm going to throw up a, a QA, QR code here. Uh, onto the screen so you can actually contact Eric and team. Um, this connects you to the email address. So if there's any questions that you have after the fact that dawns on you, please feel free. I do want to do one plug, however, for Eric. Eric mentioned how important it is to do, do the assessment. And I think obviously the much the more you can do proactively, the better. Um, so uh, Landworks offers a vulnerability assessment which is an analysis that will provide you with the insights uh, around your security ops, uh, especially highlighting any issues that may or may not have around security breaches, threats, attacks, and loss. Uh, it's a very comprehensive document, um, and it will give you the findings and recommendations on each of the, on your environment, encompassing things like Active Directory, passwords, backups, antivirus, remote access, and many other components. Um, but obviously it's a plug, but I, I want to stress, we will be sending a, the recording to everyone, including a one pager that really is a checklist that you can go through uh, yourself at your own leisure. It's a quick vulnerability assessment, two page uh, thing. And if you have any other follow-up questions, please contact Eric and team. They'll be more than happy to uh, help and address some of those concerns and questions. So with that, once again, Eric, thank you very much for, for sharing your knowledge and know-how. Thank you all the attendees for participating. We hope that was an informative session. I do invite you to participate in our quick, last quick poll. Uh, in the beginning of the session, we asked you the same question. Uh, we're kind of curious what you thought after the fact, considering uh, what you've learned here today. So uh, with that, once again, thank you very much for your participation and we'll be signing off in just one minute.